So, today's lecture will be about the polar form of complex numbers. In the last lecture, we went over the basic algebraic properties of complex numbers, and we really glossed over the details, only because I assume that all of you know all of those details, and I didn't want to bore you too much. So we went, went really quickly about closure under addition, closure under multiplication, the fact that every complex number has a unique inverse, and all of those elementary properties where everything works just perfectly. Well, I'm sure that you're familiar with the polar form as well, so let me approach it from an interesting point of view, which is to show you just how crucial it is. It's not just a nice property to have, it's a crucial property that makes complex numbers as useful as they are. And of course it's a precursor to Euler's great formula, which is what we'll discuss tomorrow. And then who knows, I think that by Monday we'll be able to prove the fundamental theorem of algebra in one line. So there is something to look forward to. It seems like a leap at this point, but it won't seem like a leap. It'll be everything works just right. So let me show you why the polar form is so very necessary. Where we left it off last time is we were just about to talk about the extraction of roots. And let's just visit what the world would have been like if complex numbers didn't have a polar form. If we had to extract roots of complex numbers without the benefit of the polar form. So consider the example, I'll just put it in general terms. So we have a complex number z, which is x plus i y, so x is the real part and y is the imaginary part, two real numbers, and we're going to extract its roots, and at this point we don't know how many there are, two or three or one or any, so we'll just set out quite generally to find a number whose square equals x plus i y. So we'll look for another complex number, a plus i b, whose square equals x plus i y. And this is the sort of thing that we did before, more than once, when we were talking about Tartaglia's formula, and we're faced, we're faced with the root, cubic root of, I believe, 2 plus square root of 5, and then a combination, I believe it was 2 plus 2 square root of negative 1, and algebraically they were similar. So there we had to extract the cubic root of a number that looked like this, structurally. Sure, it was a rational plus square root of 5 times another rational, but structurally, in terms of equations, that's what, that's what the equation looked like. And we weren't too imaginative there. We just said, square it out, multiply it out, and just match up the real and imaginary parts. And in the case of that rational plus square root of 5 times another rational, we said match up the parts that don't have the square root of 5, and match up the parts that do multiply the square root of 5. You remember all of that? Okay, so that wasn't very imaginative, and if we're not too imaginative here, here is what we'll end up with. When I multiply this out, the real part will be the familiar expression a squared minus b squared, and that would need to equal x. And the imaginary part will be 2ab, and that will need to be matched up with y. And now we think of these two equations as a system of equations for a and b, where x and y are given parameters, and a and b are the unknowns. And then we would need to solve it, and you have to agree with me that this is not an attractive proposition. I think all of you could see how you would do it. You would maybe solve for A in terms of B and plug it in here. And then I don't want to take this too far, but realize that we'll have a fourth order equation for A, because it'll be A squared and then it'll be 1 over A squared. And when you multiply it, when you get rid of denominators, it'll end, you'll end up with a to the fourth. Sure, it'll be just a to the fourth and a squared, and so you'll be able to solve that equation without too much of a problem, but <coughs> algebraically speaking, it'll get very quickly out of control. And I actually did it once, and I described it in my notes, and it was, I think, four complete pages just to get through this little system, and then I'm actually not going to include it in the final version of the textbook. Because I think the only takeaway from this is that it's not 
a very promising avenue. And that's just for square roots. Imagine doing the same thing for cubic roots where complexity grows and then higher roots, it basically becomes impenetrable. And if that was the only way to extract square roots, I don't think complex numbers would have been as great as they really are. So instead, again, I think, I think it's Euler who was the first one to figure it out. He wrote a paper that I've never read that's called on the extraction of the roots of unity, of the number one. And that's where all of this was figured out, and I believe he was using complex numbers basically as a matter of fact and without much much of a hesitation, and basically figured out all of this. So I don't know the history too well on this, let's just do it. And so what was noticed long before Euler is that when you look at what the multiplication of complex numbers is, or what the multiplication of complex numbers looks like, it basically ends up an invitation to use trigonometric identities. It's basically in your face. Here is what I mean by it. When we, when we take a plus bi and multiply it by c plus di, we end up with the real part, ac minus bd plus i, now we do need parentheses, ad plus bc. And I remember last year I was talking about this, I tried to compress complex numbers into a single lecture just to get to the fundamental theorem of algebra. And Right in lecture, I noticed that these two terms actually correspond to the errors, right? This is before Christ, and this is our current error. Have you ever noticed that? So now, I would always hesitate when writing out the, the imaginary part. I would look back and make sure I got it right. But once I noticed that, I don't have to do that anymore. It's just AD plus BC. Or if you want to put it in chronological order, BC plus AD. But it doesn't matter. So what do I mean when I say that this is an invitation to use trigonometric identities? Well, everyone knows the formula for that. I'll start with sine, because that's the one I learned first, although that's not the more fundamental of the two, I think, as far as I'm concerned. The sine of a sum Everybody knew this. Some of you may be lovers of trigonometry, and so this is this is a matter of basic culture for you guys. Some of you may not have liked trigonometry, in which case it rings a bell, and that's it. But in either case, uh, those guys knew these formulas back and forth. And the other one is for the cosine of the sum. Cosine of the sum. And this one has a minus sign in it which I remember when I first learned this, when I was studying trigonometry, that disappointed me deeply because cosine was my favorite function between cosine and sine, I preferred cosine. By the way, let's do a poll. Who prefers cosine over sine? And who prefers sine over cosine? Everybody has to vote, so we're gonna do it again. Cosine over sine? Sine over cosine? Yes, yeah, usually about 50-50. Who prefers even numbers? Who prefers odd numbers? See, it's the same people. Who has a birthday on an even day? date? Who has a birthday on an odd date? Usually there's more of a correlation. <laughs> okay, yeah, so you see how it works. People who prefer even numbers over odd numbers prefer cosines, because it's an even function, and people who prefer odd numbers prefer sines. And so just to finish that line of thought, I was disappointed by this minus sign. Okay, so yes, it is, for most people, kind of disappointing to see a minus sign here. Except later on in life you realize that it's a very, very fundamental minus sign. And if you move it here, cosine of alpha minus beta, minus beta, then this becomes a plus. And that's basically the trigonometric identity that's responsible for dot product being as simple as they are, because this is x1, x2, plus y1, y2, equals the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. So that's what makes uh, the dot products tick. And so you see that these two expressions basically follow these identities. 
So no one could have ever missed it. So basically what, maybe I'll write it out just for the sake of completeness. So from that you just realize that if you take cosine, cosine of alpha, cosine of alpha plus i sine of alpha, so of all possible complex numbers, you just consider this one where the real and the imaginary part are connected with, through this angle, so it's basically one parameter family of complex numbers, and you multiply it by cosine, it's the same combination but for the angle beta, or for the value beta, and when you multiply it out, I'm not looking over at those identities yet, but you basically get cosine alpha, cosine beta. Okay, that's the real part. And lo and behold, now I will sneak a peek here, it's cosine of alpha plus beta. So it's as if the product of complex numbers was specifically designed to take advantage of these identities. It's almost like you can forget about the square root of negative one, and it was just a device to encode these trigonometric identities. You can almost see complex numbers that way. It's specifically designed to make these two fundamental trigonometric identities work their magic. Plus i, can I fit it here? No, I cannot. That's too bad. Plus i, which equals, I'll just continue here, according to these two identities, we're cashing in on all of the design, you end up with This did not escape anyone. Even if you don't like square roots of negative one, you have to recognize that this sort of thing takes place. And that could be part of the reason why the square root of negative one stuck around and wasn't rejected. Just because, as I mentioned last time, usually you try to do away with the flaw in the argument, either sweep it under the rug or remove it in earnest, but in this particular flaw, it seemed that the flaw itself was interesting, and this is, was one of those examples. So, we can summarize the fact in the following way, and I just want to set you up for the leap to Euler's formula, because it's still a leap. So, if you consider this complex value function of a single parameter, then we have just proven this identity, f of, f of alpha times f of beta, because these two numbers are two numbers of the exact same form, so one is f of alpha, the other one is f of beta, and you end up with a third number of the exact same form with the parameter alpha plus beta. So, this is known as, I, I don't know how to pronounce the guy's name. De Mauve's theorem. In my high school it was called De Moivre's theorem, but it's De Mauve's theorem. Look this up, right? And I don't think it really escaped anyone. This was well known. And it also makes it apparent that this, if you think of it as a function, is something like an exponential. Because exponentials have the property that if you apply it to a sum, it's the same as applying it to the individual terms and then multiplying together the results. So exponentials work this way. For example, e to the power of alpha plus beta, it's the product rule of exponents, is e to the alpha times e to the beta. So this makes this function, which in no way looks like an exponential, work algebraically exactly as an exponential. 